So welcome to the Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi, the faculty host for today's seminar. Let me open with a few reminders regarding the logistics of our online presentation. We are recording this seminar and we'll post it on the seminar series website. So if you have a friend or a colleague who misses this talk, please let them know that they can catch it later on our seminar webpage. We will take questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. Please click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your questions. At the end of our presentation, we will take the questions and pose them to our speaker. You don't need to wait until after he's concluded his remarks, you can do so throughout the presentation. While I am on sabbatical this year, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be here today to host our seminar speaker, Wake Smith, who will present on After Net Zero. Wake is a senior fellow at the Mosavar Hakmani Center for Business and Government here at HKS and a lecturer in Yale College, where he teaches what is understood to be the world's first undergraduate survey course on climate engineering. The, course of that, the core of that course will be published in book form in early next year by Cambridge University Press. As a senior fellow at MRCBG, he has published papers on the aeronautics, cost, and deployment logistics of stratospheric aerosol injection, as well as on the proper governance of research into these technologies. He finished his business career in private equity with the New York-based New State Capital, and he previously served as chairman and president of PIMCO World Air Services, COO of Atlas Air Worldwide Holdings and president of the flight training division of Boeing. He started his aviation career as a bankruptcy consultant, advising on the restructurings of much of the US airline industry after deregulation. He holds a BA in history from Yale and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Wake, welcome to the Energy Policy Seminar. Thank you, Joe, very, very kind of you. I, we um, should start by observing that I'm uh, very sorry that we're not all sitting in lovely Bell Hall uh, juggling plates of burritos on our knees, but, uh, uh, but, but, but someday. Um, nonetheless, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, have an opportunity to address uh, this seminar that I have attended both physically and virtually so many times. So it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me fuss with my screen share function for a moment. So uh, I, I hope you're seeing that now, Joe. That looks good. Thank you, Wade. So um, as Joe mentioned, I am uh, publishing a book uh, uh, shortly that derives from uh, the contents of the course that I teach at Yale. The uh, book is called Pandora's Toolbox, The Hopes and Hazards of Climate Interventions, and it seeks to um, illuminate this topic of climate uh, interventions or geoengineering and situate, it, uh, situate the topic in the broader context of climate policy. Um, but let me link uh, some of those thoughts to uh, the energy transition, which is uh, of course the theme of the energy policy seminar this fall. Um, and I'll start by saying that the Paris Agreement in my view has fostered a naive optimism on 1.5 C or 2 C targets um, the, uh, those targets are written right into Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. They were chosen uh, many years before the agreement was signed, but by the time the agreement was signed, there was uh, already concern as to whether these were realistic targets. The IPCC then, uh, to bolster the perception that they are realistic targets, published in 2018, as most of you all know, the uh, SR15 uh, report that illustrated various pathways by which we could get to the 1.5 C target and hold uh, uh, temperature change to that, or more precisely be at 1.5 by the end of the century, perhaps with overshoot in the interim, perhaps not. But this figure from uh, the SR15 report illustrated a variety, but principally four um, emissions pathways by which the world might uh, move to a 1.5 C compliant 
uh, emissions and concentration status. And uh, what they mostly had in common, the, there, there's the P4 that was a little different, but the P1, 2, and 3 scenarios among the four that were principally highlighted all share the common feature uh, that they began in this very year, 2021, a luge-like uh, uh, decline in emissions every year for the coming decade uh, with the slope of emissions reductions flattening out a little bit thereafter, but in all cases reaching uh, net zero emissions by roughly 2050 or the 2050s. Ironically, we did last year uh, have the 7%-ish sort of emissions reduction that is needed to uh, uh, pursue these pathways. Um, but we, of course, did that by wrecking the economy vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Um, and so no one imagines that that is a strategy, wrecking the economy each year by which we're going to be able to achieve this. But we would, in order to be Paris compliant, need to uh, see the same sort of reduction in emissions uh, that we saw last year for the coming uh, decade. There is no expectation that that is what is in fact going to happen. Emissions, uh, as most of you know, have already snapped back to roughly their 2019 level. They're expected to exceed uh, that level uh, next year. And so we haven't yet turned the corner that we would need to turn in order to be compliant with these pathways. The general public, though, by virtue of all of that 1.5C and 2C discussion, is, insofar as I can fathom, unprepared for the sort of 3C outcomes that seem much more likely. Uh, that's just not on the general public's radar screen. Uh, what I've put up here is the uh, work, a figure from the Working Group 1 uh, report of the AR6 just released in August of this year that illustrates five uh, prospective emissions pathways by which humanity might uh, pursue its emissions trajectory over the remainder of this century. Uh, two of them down here, uh, different variations of the SSP1, what we used to call RCPs, um, are, are roughly 1.5C compliant. Uh, there are two other uh, pathways that double in this case and triple in this case uh, emissions from our current uh, level of roughly 40 gigatons a year. And in between all of those other four is this uh, SSP2 4.5 pathway that uh, illustrates increasing emissions from our current level to a uh, plateau uh, uh, in the 2030s, uh, 2040s, and then a slow decline for the remainder of the century. Although even this pathway does not get all the way to net zero by the end of the century. So if we were to pursue this pathway, we haven't by 2100 uh, either achieved net zero or therefore uh, gotten to peak temperatures. I should be clear, the IPCC doesn't say that any of these are predictions. These are simply representative pathways, but I think it's meaningful to note that the middle of the road pathway, their terminology, uh, uh, is one that doesn't uh, comply to these 1.5 or 2C targets. The 3C-ish prediction by the end of the century, despite the fact that the public, I think, is generally unprepared for that, seems like the more likely outcome. Uh, again, this, is the, this column is the uh, global average surface temperature anomaly relative to the late 19th century baseline that would obtain in the last 20 years of this century, let's call it 2090. Um, and this uh, suggests that by 2090, if we pursue this uh, pathway, we're up 2.7 degrees with more to follow, because again, we still will not have achieved net zero by that time. So to uh, borrow a term from Ted Nordhaus, uh, I worry that the energy transition is likely to be a slow muddle rather than the luge-like trajectory that the SR15 report suggests it might be. Uh, 
To be clear, progress on renewables is thrilling and uh, is uh, accelerating at a pace that would have been difficult to predict 10 years ago. Nonetheless, uh, there are all sorts of obstacles to the rapid uh, energy transition that we all might hope for. There is, of course, uh, the intermittency of wind and solar, the limited storage capacity in uh, our electric grid and most electric grids. Uh, the grid itself is insufficient for the amount of uh, power shipment from windy regions to non-windy regions or where it's sunny to where it's cloudy that would be necessary to permit greater penetration of wind and solar. Even if we address the uh, uh, energy transition, we've got recalcitrant industrial sectors, cement, uh, steel, uh, aviation, long haul trucking, surface shipping, all of which will require different uh, solutions, including perhaps hydrogen. There are then, of course, the non-CO2 uh, greenhouse gases, which had their own little emissions trajectories in both the SR15 and the uh, uh, AR6 figures. There is the possibility that the sort of rivalry political scenarios which lead to the very high uh, emission scenarios illustrated in the AR6 report, those could happen. Uh, uh, those could hamper the sort of international cooperation that will be necessary to achieve rapid net zero. We can't rule those out. That's why they're illustrated there. Uh, developing countries uh, in many cases are very focused on past emissions with the idea that it is those that have emitted most in the past, such as the US, that ought therefore to undertake the uh, emissions reductions in the immediate future and that developing countries should defer their emissions reductions until they catch up developmentally. But that would be a substantial drag on uh, uh, the progression to net zero nonetheless. Uh, many large developing countries have yet to submit NDCs to uh, the upcoming uh, COP26. Speaking of COP26, a major issue on the agenda there will be the Global North's hesitancy to fully fund the adaptation funding uh, that was promised to the glo Global South. And then we've got fossil fuel economies, which will not only be reluctant to stop exporting uh, fossil fuels, but to stop using them themselves. All of these are reasons to be cautious about the uh, speed with which we should expect uh, to decarbonize. Nonetheless, the race to net zero is the most successful climate framing that the world has devised to date. There is buy-in on this concept of trying to achieve net zero all over the world, not the entire world, but uh, uh, lots of the world, lots of polities, lots of firms, lots of individuals are buying into the net zero framing. Uh, few taxpayers or consumers are eager for the higher costs that the, a, a rapid move to net zero would require. Uh, and we're therefore sort of in the awkward era of bold pronouncements unmatched by effective action although with laudable exceptions uh, in, in primarily Europe. Moreover, we're not in a unified race to net zero, but rather in a tug of war per the Kaya identity where uh, our emissions are informed by at least four principal terms, two of which are pulling in the wrong direction. So population is continuing to increase and per capita income, it is everyone's goal to increase. Uh, th those both create increasing demand for uh, emissions. Uh, energy intensity and carbon intensity have been falling, but the problem we have uh, in this tug of war is that every year for the past century with very few exceptions, the first two terms keep overwhelming the second two terms, such that our annual emissions keep growing. So we have not turned the corner we need to turn. Nonetheless, I mentioned exceptions. Uh, the EU, UK, Norway are bravely pioneering paths to undertake local cost for global benefit. And again, hats off to them 
for pursuing such paths. But I'm worried that much of the world, instead of volunteering to take on local cost for global benefit, will wait in respect of drastic climate action until technological breakthroughs render that drastic climate action nearly free. And that's when we will finally have much broader in, uh, uptake of the sort of actions that are required. But despite all the reasons to be cautious, we must find a way to net zero. We must some way win this battle. We can't keep fouling our atmosphere and fouling the climate for future generations. Through a combination of carrots and sticks and technology breakthroughs, we have to somehow travel this curve all the way down to net zero. But I've taken years and uh, uh, you know uh, both the X and the Y axis off of this because it's difficult to predict when this will happen. But again, it must somehow happen. So with a tip of the hat to uh, uh, a prior uh, presentation of David Keith's, uh, let me for a moment pause right on this juncture, the year when we might achieve net zero emissions. This would be a somewhat artificial uh, declaration. It's not something we will measure precisely and, and uh, know exactly, but I imagine that the world someday will be close enough uh, the trajectory will be right, and it will declare that next year is the net zero emissions year. We have finally done it. And one could imagine uh, on New Year's Eve of that net zero emissions year that the heads of state of all of the world's countries gather again on the banks of the Seine in Paris to celebrate this enormous achievement. Um, uh, Non-carbon based fireworks that we hope uh, uh, go off overhead. Uh, people pop champagne and handshakes give way to full body hugs. This truly would be uh, occasion for celebration. It would be a, a, an achievement on the scale of the moon. Vision uh, would be a, a required to achieve it. But when, the when matters greatly. Again, I took the uh, uh, years off of the uh, bottom axis, so we might achieve this, but the when matters greatly. After all, this is a tank and flow problem um, uh, in terms of CO2 only rather than all greenhouse gases in CO2 equivalents to put some numbers on this. Our, our, our emissions flow into our bathtub is at about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. The natural drain out of the bathtub by which uh, CO2 is turned into stone is so slow, it is for all intents and purposes clogged. It is certainly running at less than a gigaton of a year. So 40 gigatons in, one gigaton out, less than, and therefore the bathtub, the level of water in the bathtub continues to rise. The climate doesn't care about the, the spigot flow. Turning off the water to net zero, that's not what informs the climate. The climate is informed by the level of emissions, concentrate, excuse me, the concentration, uh, the le water level in the bathtub when we finally turn the spigot off. But when we do that, the drain is still clogged. Net zero, therefore, is a means, not an end. The end goal that we're after is an acceptable climate at the sunset of the fossil fuel era. That's the goal. If we reach net zero early, say in the 2050s, as the SR15 would urge us, that likely gets us there. That likely gets us to the end of the fossil fuel age before we've ruined the climate in an unacceptable fashion to future generations. But late net zero does not get us there. If we drive twice as far, on the same road as we had intended, we don't get to our destination late. 
we get to an entirely different climate destination, an unacceptable climate by the time we retire fossil fuels. And if that's where we end up when we reach net zero, we have a very different problem. After net zero, temperatures simply stabilize. That's the best understanding that we currently have for centuries. Again, this is something that I don't think the general public is attuned to. I think the general public imagines that when we reach net zero, we have that big celebration in Paris. It's because we've solved the climate problem, but that isn't so. To reach for a World War II analogy, net zero isn't VJ day or VE day, the days the war was won. It's not even Stalingrad or Midway, the battles where the, the tide finally turned. Reaching net zero is getting the last man off the beach at Dunkirk. It's merely the, be the end of the beginning. It's by no means the end. Well, if temperatures merely stabilize after net zero for centuries and temperatures inform climate damages, then climate damages merely stabilize after net zero, but they're not going down or being eliminated. In fact, a terrible thought that some future generation standing there on the banks of the Seine on that New Year's Eve will have to contend with is that the aggregate climate damages in the century before net zero are considerably smaller than those that will obtain in the century after net zero. After doing all the work to decarbonize, they will have to live with sustained high climate damages in fact, not all climate damages will behave this nicely. Sea level rise, for instance, we know will continue to grow for centuries after we reach net zero, because given the thermal uh, inertia of the oceans and the cryosphere, uh, this system is by no means in balance when we finally turn the spigot off. 3C in 2100 is unfortunately a very plausible possibility. I worry it may be likely, but I don't need to convince you that it's likely. I don't even need to convince me that it's likely. It's certainly plausible. And not by the way, as a high impact, low probability outcome, but as a middle of the road SSP. It's a contingency sufficiently within the realm of foreseeability that responsible plans have to begin to account for this possibility. We need to stop burying the public's head in 1.5 C sand. So what would be demanded by such a future? The people standing there on the banks of the Seine, now that they realize that they've gotten to net zero and they haven't solved their problem in their lifetime, what will they demand? obviously more action, they may not ask nicely. But via what tools are we going to take further action to solve the problem that those people will have from that day forward? The decarbonization level will be exhausted. We're already at net zero. We can't get to net zero -er by remediate, you know, further mitigating our emissions. Our emissions are gone. No further flus to remediate either. Uh, we can plant trees and restore mangroves, but these are saturable, saturable, fragile sinks, a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than the problem we need to solve. And moreover, as the recent forest fires in California and Siberia demonstrate, the natural fate of forests is flame. So if a forest that we plant for the purpose of uh, sucking down carbon burns, we're merely back to square one. Soil carbon sequestration, with 10 billion people on the earth, uh, land use may continue to be a net source rather than a sink by that juncture. Other natural solutions are more low capacity window dressing. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do them, but they're not going to be the primary solution for the problem. The obvious answer is going to be direct air capture with 
uh, a geologic storage. The problem that we will be trying to solve by that time and with that tool will no longer be excess emissions. Rather, it will be excessive concentrations in the absence of emissions. We need to de devise a new anthropogenic drain for that overfull bathtub. This is likely technologically feasible. There's more than sufficient storage capacity all over the earth, but it would be hugely expensive at a cost of $100 per ton of CO2 removed, which is the lowest cost that the literature currently uh, supports. Their uh, Climeworks current cost is 10 times that. But even at $100 a ton, removing 40 gigatons of CO2 per year, which is the level of our current emissions, that would require an industry the size of the entire fossil fuel industry today, $4 trillion a year, 5% of current gross world product. That's all the oil industry, all the gas industry, all the coal industry. That's how big an industry would be required to undertake uh, direct air capture and sequestration at that pace. Now, the economy may have grown dramatically by then, so maybe by then it's only 1% of the world economy, but it's still a huge uh, economic obligation that we are proposing to export to the future. But at 40 gigatons a year, re removing enough CO2 to return the climate to an acceptable state, that may take a century. Now, could we speed it up? Perhaps my 40 gigaton a year uh, threshold was uh, a somewhat arbitrary one set at the level we're now uh, emitting. Um, uh, so might it go faster? Maybe. But I think it's reasonable to measure the span that would be required via carbon direct air capture um, uh, to restore the uh, concentrations to a level that the future would, have, would find acceptable. I think it's reasonable to measure that time span in terms of human lifetimes. It may take one or two or three lifetimes to do that. Will several generations stand for 3C magnitude climate damages for their entire lifetime? Not willingly, certainly not if there appears to be a cheap and handy option, and maybe there is a cheap and handy option. Of course, SRM and specifically SAI. Cost-wise, this is tens of billions of, dollar, uh, of dollars per year rather than trillions. It's clear that it would cool the planet given uh, the volcanic uh, analogs. Uh, it's also clear to me, at least, that we could implement it. My own personal research on the logistics indicates that it would be a substantial undertaking, of course, but reasonably straightforward. On the other hand, by no means am I trying to pre-sell this. It is entirely unclear what physical harms SAI might bring or how to govern it in a way that the entire planet would find acceptable and legitimate. But a too hot future might find SAI irresistible. And so the sooner we probe the downsides and the governance issues, the better. For flue gas capture, uh, flue gas capture provides a clear way forward for CDR. Similar capture technology to direct air capture, exact same transport and storage infrastructure, uh, more efficient to capture from CO2 rich flues than from direct air. So every flu that we can't remediate, at least if it's of a material size, we need to remediate, we need to, uh, that we can't eliminate, we need to remediate. There's no sensible path to net zero without this in my view, but there's a clear way forward on uh, carbon capture generally. For SAI, uh, we need to start field experiments. If we flirt with 3C temperatures late in this century, the future will be very tempted to consider SAI, irrespective of what the present thinks about it. Our choices today are not whether to permit the future to deploy SAI, that's not within our grasp. 
Rather, our choices are whether to bequeath them with knowledge or ignorance about the potential impacts of SAI, and whether we bequeath them to them considered governance structures or a governance vacuum. Those are the choices that we have today vis-a-vis -vis SAI. Climate pathway optimists uh, uh, consider that uh, climate interventions of both sorts are a false solution that shirks responsibility for ongoing emissions and risks propping up the fossil fuel industry, which in some sense got us into this mess while crowding out mitigation. And all of those criticisms may be fair if one imagines climate interventions as plan B, a, the plan B solution for decarbonization. But if my pathway pessimism bears out, and P.S. I hope that it does not, the primary significance of climate interventions will prove not as a plan B for problem A, which is high ongoing emissions, but as the plan A solutions for problem B, which is the persistence of potentially unacceptable climate damages after net zero. Great, thank you, Wake. Uh, very much appreciate that. I also want to note for our attendees uh, that if you have a question for Wake, you can use the Q&A function, the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can also check the chat uh, where in response to one uh, request that we received during the presentation uh, in the Q&A box, I put in the chat the name of Wake's book and the link to the Cambridge University Press website, uh, the URL for his book. Uh, that'll be coming out early uh, next year. So in, 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 in fact, Joe, I should say that my mother, who's the only person who's gonna buy this book has told me it's already available for pre-order on Amazon, so. <laughs> uh, so you're, you're welcome to, to try to boost the uh, author rating uh, and the ranking of the book on Amazon for Wake. If you wanna go ahead and pre-order there uh, as well. Uh, so you can check that out, Pandora's uh, Toolbox. So uh, let me open with a, a couple of questions for Wake as our attendees are typing away uh, their questions. Um, th there's some of this where the, the framing here, Wake, is um, we may find in a world in which if we're incredibly successful on net zero, we're still going to want to have access to and deploy some of these climate engineering solutions to deal with what will be um, the the, the changing climate that we're living through and that, that our uh, successor generations are living through. How should we think about what's the scale of human suffering on climate change before we really need to be serious in our public debates uh, when, with our engagement with stakeholders and the public alike um, to really bring this to the fore? Because there are people who look at the climate damages or what we think are the extreme weather events this year that may have been amplified by climate change and say climate change seems really bad now. And yet this summer, even though it had that warmest July on record globally, some extreme forest fires, heat waves, flooding and hurricanes, it may well be one of the calmer summers for the balance of this century. How would you think about trying to bring this issue to the fore for the public debate that's necessary so that we can address some of these questions you teed up there at the end about whether we're going to bequeath the knowledge about this technology and bequeath the governance system for this technology or not to the future. So firstly, let me note that I'm clusing together under the term climate interventions, two very different families of climate interventions. And some people's terminology doesn't include both of them, but mine does. And so in responding, those being carbon removal on the one hand and SRM uh, or more specifically SAI uh, on the other. And my response to your question is different in respect of each of them. Um, in, in respect of uh, carbon dioxide removal, first from flus and then from direct air, um, there is no world that I can foresee in which we won't need that. 
Um, uh, again, all of the SR15 uh, pathways, every one has substantial amounts of carbon removal in it. Um, uh, in some cases, carbon removal from flues will be cheaper than other uh, decarbonization options. Um, uh, in other cases, uh, we, we, we will, uh, it, it, things like uh, airline emissions, um, you know, carbon capture isn't a solution there. We're going to need net negative uh, uh, interventions that will offset uh, the continuing ongoing positive uh, emissions that will derive from some sectors. So we need uh, carbon removal and we need flue gas capture immediately in my view. Um, how much pain will be required before the world is willing to undertake the much more risky and scary uh, intervention of say SAI? Uh, the short answer is more. Uh, I think that if we knew, um, I was having this discussion with uh, Richard Zeckhauser on Friday, if we knew that the 2020 level of climate damages was the worst we were ever going to experience, we'd be thrilled with that. Yes, there are forest fires, yes, there are hurricanes, but uh, by and large, the world is thriving despite them. The economy is growing again and people are surviving. What's scary about the 2020 weird weather and so on isn't what they meant for 2020, it's what they portend for 2050 and 2100. And uh, again, there's just a great deal of uncertainty as that um, figure from the AR6 illustrated there's an enormous amount of uncertainty as to what emissions pathway humanity may choose. And I think that at minimum, we need to begin contingency planning for the possibility that the pathway that the future chooses is not the one we would recommend and other solutions may be required. Um, let me stop there. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me go to a question from my colleague, uh, Bill Hogan, who, uh, would like to know how this analysis relates to the optimal timing of net zero that follows from a benefit cost analysis like uh, what is done by Bill Nordhaus at Yale. I don't think that the world is going to be governed by Bill Nordhaus at Yale. Um, I say that as a Yalean, you know, um, if, 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 if economists and scientists ruled the world, um, we would do things very differently. Um, so, so DICE would say that we should uh, uh, begin to undertake some things like phasing out coal right away. Uh, but we're, it's not yet clear we're phasing out coal. We may be at peak coal, but, but we sure haven't turned in sharp corner. Um, and so I, I guess maybe I'm mostly objecting to the predicate of the question, but I, I, I don't think that that's the way the world is going to uh, unfold. I, I don't think that uh, optimal climate policy is going to govern actual climate outcomes to a very material degree. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how we think about the governance uh, of of such an approach. And uh, I'm gonna to go to one question that's in our queue and then, then I have another question that will follow up on, on the governance issue. Um, what do you think is the needed coalition? And we can be open-minded. Is this a coalition of national governments? Could it also include private firms? Whoever may be the key players in this coalition to test or pilot SAI solutions that you've discussed in your presentation? And who do you think in terms of countries or companies or even universities that will be leading the charge in this work? I guess, let me firstly say, I'm not um, a wild-eyed SAI deployment advocate at this time. I, I continue to think there's all sorts of reasons to be uh, cautious and even fearful about this technology in part due to physical impacts, but in part, again, due to this complicated issue of governance. I think the, the path to SAI hell is a path in which we have multiple competing, uh, uncoordinated, potentially cacophonous uh, 
uh, SAI programs undertaken by differing national govern governments. Um, we wouldn't know how to calibrate such a program well. We wouldn't know how to attribute subsequent climate impacts to uh, geoengineering or underlying climate change and whose program and so on. Um, uh, so, so I uh, pray that if we approach this technology at all, that we find some way to do it as a unitary global program governed by the Oxford principles with uh, transparency and public input and done not for profit and so on. But what I've just outlined is a Pollyanna-ish vision and I acknowledge that it is. Um, I guess therefore, if what we're shooting for is something that's currently Pollyanna-ish, um, the sooner we start trying to figure out how to put that architecture in place, the better. In the absence of that ar uh, architecture, if instead the governance um, landscape that we bequeath to future generations is a vacuum, there is every risk that SAI is undertaken by some non-global actor, not the green finger scenario of David Victor, where a, you know, a billionaire is going to do this from his Pacific Island, uh, you know, to try to save the world. Um, rather, it would be a country um, uh, whose wet bulb temperature spikes continue to kill half of its livestock in the fields and tens of thousands of people in their beds. And, and that country finally says, I can't stand it, world. You're dithering and my people are dying. And I'm going to begin myself. And I'm not trying to solve the whole world's problem. I'm just putting stuff in my own airspace. And I have every right to do that under international law. And if you don't like it, come shoot down my planes. If that's a midget country, maybe we'll consider shooting down their planes if that's why don't I not fill in any name, but if it's a country with a big enough military to defend itself, that creates real dilemmas for the world. And so another thing that I think is important in this decade is to begin to put in place the sorts of governance constraints that would um, uh, both forewarn a prospective unilateral act actor that the world would respond to such a thing as a provocation, and ideally to put in place in international law some uh, guardrails about what countries can and cannot do within their own sovereign airspace that may nonetheless have climate impacts for uh, people elsewhere. So when we think about the governance uh, of, of solar geoengineering and building off your, your, your final comments there, um, there may be some lessons that we can draw and, and they're not all positive from how we've been thinking about the governance on mitigating our emissions of greenhouse gases. And we can look at, at efforts dating back now for three decades through the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change process, where we've tried to get countries to come together to agree on how they're gonna mitigate their emissions. Sometimes we call those emission mitigation commitments legally binding, sometimes they're voluntary. And I think uh, it raises questions though that when we think about the current regime under the Paris framework of 2015, countries are voluntarily identifying what their emission goals are going to be and they submit that and they do subject it to transparency, but there's really no way in which we can sort of formally compel a country to reduce its emissions further. And so it's this sort of coordination on, on voluntary emission goals. Uh, it sounds like the way you're describing it, we wouldn't want an approach like that on solar geoengineering. So is there another model that's different than what we have for emissions mitigation under the UN Framework Convention? Is there another model of coordination, another treaty framework that gives you some sense of like, here's how we might be able to move forward in a sensible way in governing the experimentation and potentially the deployment of uh, SAI in the future? Well, firstly, let me say that back to the two halves of our geoengineering toolbox, um, the governance challenges related to uh, carbon dioxide removal, I think, are exactly the same as those that pertain to mitigation. We're asking people to undertake uh, local cost for global benefit. So we've got a collective action problem. We've got a free rider problem. The question is how to um, uh, you know, motivate the laggards to catch up to the vanguard and keep everybody on a 
a program that, that uh, the world can converge on. All of that's the exact same um, governance set of challenges. And so I can easily imagine that such governance of CDR, which PS will totally be necessary, would fit under the, 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 the Paris agreements. And that governance will be necessary because people will want credit for the CDR they're undertaking. There will be international funds flows of, of country A paying country B to, to either capture or store carbon. Um, uh, there's all of the uh, requirements to know who's doing what and whether people are really sequestering the carbon they, they're being paid to sequester and so on. So all, uh, you know, Paris, I think, or, or the UNFCCC is a great, um, uh, not only analog, but precursor to the governance needed in that regime. SAI, totally different thing in my view. There, we're going to focus mostly on negative governance, not making people do stuff they don't want to do, but preventing people from doing stuff we don't want them to do. And SAI is so cheap that we famously are confronted in respect of it with the free driver problem, that it's so cheap that parties could uh, seek to undertake it unilaterally. Um, that seems to be technically, technically feasible and it may prove to be financially feasible if the problem is great enough. Again, maybe not undertaking it for the whole globe, just for their own country. Um, so that the, the, the governance frameworks are different. Um, SAI would ideally be done again under a single global coordinating um, uh, executive function that doesn't now exist and doesn't particularly, that, that doesn't sound like the UN to me. Uh, the UN is is pretty bad at, at, at executive functions such as that, where we've got a uh, you know got a positive program we've got to implement. Uh, but I don't know who other than the UN has the legitimacy to undertake such a thing. Um, so I I'm I'm a, this this is a long way of saying on the SAI side of the thing I don't know I don't currently know of a. Um, uh, body that is empowered and seems, you know, fit for this purpose. Um, again, I think the initial steps in governance are simply negative governance, putting in place clear expectations of what people can't do without drawing a reaction from the world. Um, the positive governance necessary to actually implement this pro th such a program. I mean, I, I, I think the good news is global implementation of the sort that I'm describing, I think is decades away. So we've got time. Again, way, what may not be many decades away is unilateral actions that require the sort of negative governance that uh, treaties and international law could put in place. So Wake, it sounds like you're describing this kind of approach of restraint in how we think about the governance, at least near term, it may have analogs, not necessarily in international environmental agreements, but perhaps in arms control, the non prolif treaty, where we've seen efforts in the past to try to restrain or limit uh, the development of weapons, the testing of weapons, or the development of nuclear uh, technologies for, uh, for military purposes. Would, would that be a, to, to digest what you just said, is that a fair characterization? Or do you think I there's actually, some, some imperfections in that, in that analogy? I think there's more imperfections than the opposite in that actually what we do need here is testing. In the nuclear arena, um, it became clear that if we could prevent testing, we could inhibit um, uh, capabilities development. I think in respect of SAI, the main problem is we're not doing any testing. Um, and so we're, we're just as dumb as we were 10 years ago about how what impacts it would have and whether calcium carbonate would work better than uh, SO2 and you know how the microphysical evolution of um, uh, aluminum you know in the atmosphere might uh, there's just we, we've done quite, quite literally no field testing of this. Um, uh, and I think in unlike the nuclear arena, um, we, we need uh, restraints in respect of deployment but we need accelerants in respect of research so that you know, a, a scenario I fear is that a too hot future 
that has been deprived of knowledge because we in the present thought we could pull the wool over its eyes just ends up deciding it's got to deploy and too bad that we haven't done a couple of decades of experiments to understand this. The, the emergency is too hot. Um, and uh, so I um, think that we need uh, a governance regime that not only permits, but funds and encourages uh, research. Again, consistent with the Oxford principles, open and so on, but the public uh, engagement, uh, uh, you know, full transparency, um, uh, publishing of results, um, but the uh, National Academy of Science uh, research agenda that was released in March in respect of uh, SRM, SRM more broadly, so including cloud modifications as well, I think that is a, uh, an enormously positive uh, uh, direction in which to seek to go with this technology. We, um, you know, keeping the world ignorant and incapable about it, that's not going to work forever. So I, I want to go to the National Academy's report in, in, in a moment, but first, uh, you made a brief reference to, to calcium carbonate, and that actually is, is related to one of the questions we received in the Q&A uh, about how we think about the use of sulfate particles uh, as uh, the primary means for SAI, at least given sort of, sort of current considerations of the technology. And so the question uh, is raising this concern about the risk. We know from burning coal and, and burning petroleum products uh, that the sulfur emissions have adverse effects on public health and on ecosystems. How should we think about that in the context of SAI if we're taking what appears to be basically the same sulfate particles and instead of having them come out of smokestacks or out of tailpipes, putting them out uh, deposited or injected into the atmosphere um, uh, through an SAI intervention? So it's a nuanced issue. Um, we're hauling these uh, particles up to uh, the stratosphere so that they don't come down quickly on the heads of people. Uh, they would mostly migrate via the Brewer-Dobson circulation to the poles and descend on parts of the earth where few people live. But that doesn't mean there are no ecosystems there or that some of it may come, some of it may not come down in other places, it would. Um, the so it is a problem to be uh, considered. On the other hand, um, sulfates are the devil we know because nature puts them in the stratosphere all by itself. And so there are fewer um, uh, unanswered questions about how they would behave in the stratosphere and what uh, kinds of impacts they would have in the stratosphere than there would be with most any other uh, substance that we might consider. Um, if we're putting a small amount of sulfur in the uh, stratosphere, it, it, we're talking about less than 1% of our current sulfur emissions. So while that's a non-zero number, it's not a big uh, increase in uh, the global concentrations. On the other hand, if we went to a very large SAI program intended to offset many degrees Celsius of uh, warming, then the concentrations might start to be material. I think that conflicting, conflicting set of considerations would likely mean that sulfur, the devil we know, would be the place to start such a program while that program is small and experimental and we can thereby remove from the list of experimental, you know, the, 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 the list of variables, uh, that one. But I think that if the world decided after a decade or so that this program was beneficial, it wasn't producing impacts that are unacceptable in other ways, the world likely would evolve to some aerosol number two. And there's a list of candidates as to what aerosol two might be, um, but I think it would be unwise to engage in a century of uh, SAI intervention intending only to use sulfur. I think that would be the wrong answer. But, but I don't want to pretend I'm a scientist here. I'm a finance guy, I'm a truck driver. Uh, somebody else has got to figure out what the load is that we're hauling to the stratosphere. So if you're a fi uh, the, the finance guy, let me ask you a question about funding of the research. Um, and, and you indicated the importance of doing the experimentation so we're not ignorant and that we've, we've effectively lost 
a decade where we haven't done much research and one could argue there's not been all that much done uh, with the notable exception of, of, of a few scholars, including our, our colleague David Keith and, and his program here at, at Harvard. Um, but we really went from 2009, the Royal Society in the UK issued a big report on solar geoengineering. Um, but then, you know, largely very little work being done, uh, very little work being done funded by governments. Uh, and then this year we have the National Academies report that you referenced coming out with a vision for a research program. And, and I'd like your take in, in, in uh, our final question for today's session uh, of how we should interpret both their sort of substantive uh, recommendations for research, but also their call for funding on the order of 20 to $40 million a year over five years. Because in one sense, I may look at that and say, last year we appropriated $4 million to NOAA for solar geoengineering research. The first time the federal government, uh, the first time the US Congress has appropriated monies for the federal government explicitly for solar geoengineering research. But one could also say when we look at the potential risk that solar geoengineering could reduce from climate change and the human suffering and the damages, that 20 to 40 million seems small compared to that. So how should I think about this initial recommendation in terms of scaling up the research funding? Uh, is what the, the National Academy has called for, is it reasonable? Is it at least a first step? Or should we be thinking much larger than that if we're going to be serious about this being one of our tools in combating climate change? All of those latter things that you've said, it is the, 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 the National Academy's uh, report lays out a thoughtful and serious agenda. It would be an enormous uh, step forward and the, 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 the most forward step that, that anyone in the world has proposed in respect of this. Um, it is way too small to uh, be the full basis to make decisions about such a program. But again, the good news is as long as we constrain um, unilateral local actors, um, uh, we've got time. The, a, a big global program isn't right around the corner. I don't know of anyone that is calling for that. Um, and so uh, the National Academy's agenda uh, would be a, a sensible place to start. And so too, uh, would the National Academy's agenda in respect of carbon removal that was issued in uh, 2019 with many, many times the amount of, you know, eight or nine billion of funding over the, in this decade, as opposed to the hundred million called for uh, in the uh, uh, SRM report. But um, both of these, I think, are research programs that are essential. Um, let me end by saying none of this is meant to be plan B for decarbonization. The, the climate intervention space has abused itself or been abused, but characterizing this as an alternative to uh, uh, net zero is just not helpful framing and not, uh, not, not the way this will ultimately be used in the world. Um, th these are... Uh, CDR is going to be necessary at minimum to accelerate uh, the timing on which we achieve net zero. Uh, it, it, as long as that timing is late, we're going to need it hugely thereafter. Uh, SAI does a different thing, but the future, which is to decouple ongoing high concentrations from ongoing high climate damages, but the world in the future may need that decoupling. So uh, as a reminder to our audience, uh, we will meet again next week on uh, Monday, October 4th at 12 o'clock. My colleague Henry Lee will host Judy Chang, the Undersecretary of Energy and Climate Solutions for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And she will speak on planning for decarbonization at the state level. Finally, please join me in thanking Wake Smith for the discussion today. Thank you, Wake. Thank you. Everybody enjoys uh, the rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>